President Trump celebrating Christmas in Florida, attending Christmas Eve services last night in Palm Beach with the First Lady at the same church they were married in 2005. A beautiful place right on the water there in Palm Beach. And a good morning and very Merry Christmas to you. Great to be with you. Great to be with you at home. I'm Leland Vittert. Welcome to America's News Headquarters. Yeah, Merry Christmas, everybody. I'm Cheryl Cassoni. Well, the President and First Lady also fielding calls from children, calling the Santa trackers at NORAD to find out when Santa would arrive. One boy telling the President about his ailing grandmother. If that is the best. So you want your grandma to get out of the hospital. That's, your, that's what you wish is? That is great. That's better than asking for some boy or something, right? That's much better. <laughs> Rich Edson's live in West Palm Beach, Florida. Rich. Yeah, good morning, Cheryl. And nothing on the president's schedule thus far on Christmas Day. It is another beautiful December day here in South Florida. The kind, though, the president or really anybody else may want to spend outdoors here. The president and first lady, though, did offer their Christmas wishes, tweeting out a video a short while ago. On behalf of Melania, myself, Barron, and the entire Trump family, God bless you, God bless America, and have a very, very Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. President and Mrs. Trump attended religious services last evening at the nearby Bethesda by the Sea. It's an Episcopal church. It's where they were married 12 years ago. Yesterday, the president held a teleconference with service members and then spoke to some kids who thought they were going to chat with Santa. Instead, they talked Christmas gifts with the president of the United States. The president also defended his first year in the White House, tweeting out, quote, the tax cut reform bill, including massive Alaska drilling and the repeal of the highly unpopular individual mandate, brought it all together as to what an incredible year we had. Don't let the fake news convince you otherwise, and our insider polls are strong, though some outsider polls show the president is upside down in his support of the country, and there is a very long to-do list in Congress, especially when it comes to budgeting, when it comes to other issues like immigration and health care. Now, the White House, the administration, also is looking to cut the U.S. foreign aid budget. There's some news on that front where uh, Nikki Haley, the United Nations ambassador, uh, the U.S. ambassador to the United Nations, announced that the U.S. has helped secure $285 million worth of budget cuts to the United Nations budget. She said in a statement, quote, the historic reduction in spending, in addition to many other moves toward a more efficient, accountable U.N., is a big step in the right direction. While we are pleased with the results of this year's budget negotiations, you can be sure we'll continue to look at ways to increase the U.N.'s efficiency while protecting our interests. We also have a bit of news here. The president, according uh, to the White House now, has been briefed on a suicide attack in Kabul. That's per the White House press secretary, Sarah Sanders. That's all we have on that now. Keep you updated throughout the day. Cheryl and Leland, back to you. All right, we'll try and get some more details on that. Rich Edson, uh, live for us out in Florida. Thank you so much, Rich. All right, for a little bit more, let's bring in Kelly Jane Torrance, Deputy Managing Editor for The Weekly Standard, joining us from Washington. Kelly Jane, always uh, nice to see you. Merry Christmas to you. Uh, start with this. The president uh, clearly is trying to set up uh, his first year wins in these tweets as he's down in Florida talking about his first year successes. What's the White House plan to translate those into 2018 political capital? Well, Merry Christmas, Leland. And I think they're trying. This is the first time really all year we have seen the Republican Party united uh, with senators, congressmen, and the president. And it's something, you know, you could tell the mood was really great and everybody was excited to be this united when Mitch McConnell himself said that he actually had been getting used to the Donald Trump's tweets and he didn't mind the tweets so much. You, you know, that, that's, uh, that, that means that they're, they're pretty happy that with the tax bill passing and they're, they're in a good mood. Now the question is, will it last? And, you know, as your reporter mentioned, there's a lot of big issues coming up in 2018 that there's a lot less agreement on within the Republican party than there was on tax reform and I think uh, they're they're trying to mm. keep this un unity yeah. going well and, and certainly there's a lot more division and there's a lot harder things coming up immigration what to do about DACA much much more division within the Republican Party about that than there is about about tax reform building the wall how to fund it etc we know Mitch McConnell Paul Ryan are going to head up to Camp David to try to get everybody on the same page in terms of whether to go after infrastructure first or immigration or defense spending first uh, what are the must-dos for Republicans in 2018 
to keep the momentum going into the midterms? I mean, the very first thing, of course, is to pass the spending bill. You know, they, they did a last-minute fix that only goes until January 19th, so they have to fund the government. And this is, even here, we're going to see some, uh, you know, disunion amongst the Republicans because you have a lot of people, as you mentioned, military spending is coming up, and a lot of Republicans want to increase military spending with all of the uh, security problems we're seeing around the globe. But mm. you have the deficit hawks who are nervous about increasing spending in any direction. And you sort of wonder, are they, some of these Republicans going to get Democratic support in the Senate for this? Well, Democrats say they're only going to support increased military spending if it goes with increased domestic spending and you well, add that the you know the tax well, and, they, and, they, and they have to they have to get democratic support uh, in the Senate for any spending bill you've got to get 60 votes in the Senate that's why they've kept kicking the can down the road what are you hearing from Democrats are they ready at some point uh, to take a stand and to be willing to say we are not going to keep voting for these CRs unless there is movement on something like immigration unless Democrats get a win yeah, I think that DACA is going to be the, the hill on which they're willing to die. And the thing is, a lot of Republicans want to see a fix here. It's a very sympathetic group of people, the young people who came here illegally, but as children through no fault of their own. And a lot of Republicans are sympathetic to that. The problem is, Democrats are really unwilling to give Republicans mm. anything that yeah. looks like a win because they see Trump as toxic and they don't want to aid the Republican Party with wins going into the midterms. Well, yeah, and they certainly seem from their base, at least, standing up to President Trump is something uh, that's helpful for them. I want to get your read on this. This is a tweet that President Trump set out. People are proud to be saying Merry Christmas again. I'm never sure people weren't proud to say Merry Christmas, but he continues, I'm proud to have led the charge against the assault of our cherished and beautiful phrase, Merry Christmas. This is something the president has been on uh, for months now, uh, this sort of the quote unquote war on Christmas and champion the Merry Christmas cause. Does that work beyond his base or is that solely a play there for them to perhaps uh, mollify things like having not built the wall yet? I think you're right, Leland. I think it's it's kind of to the base because, let's face it, in this country, if you look the whole month of December, all of the advertising is focused on Christmas. And I have to say, I hear people every year saying Merry Christmas. Maybe I'm hearing a little bit of it more this year, I have to admit, even here in Washington, D.C., which certainly is not Trump country. Uh, but on the whole, I think, you know, people sort of, uh, most people other than Trump's base think the war on Christmas is a bit exaggerated because we see Christmas everywhere in December. But, you know, this is something where Trump was partly elected to sort of stick it to the elites. Mm -hmm. And this is one issue on which the base see the elites as sort of yeah. trying to tamp down on any sort of religious expression in the public square. Yeah. And Trump's saying, hey, I'm against that. I've, I've been standing up for you. Well, w whether it's the NFL protests or Merry Christmas or some of the other cultural issues, you, you do see the president's base rally around him uh, when he takes these stands. Hey, great to see you, Kelly Jane. Thanks for coming in on Christmas. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks. Merry Christmas to you and uh, Cheryl. All, all the best. I'll Cheryl? You as well. Well, some sad news to bring you this Christmas morning. Five people are dead after a plane crash on Christmas Eve. This happened in central Florida at Bartow Municipal Airport. Officials say the Cessna 340 twin engine took off in dense fog and then crashed near the end of the runway. The sheriff recounting what a witness told him. He said, I couldn't believe that they were taken off in this fog. And you can hear the engine as it revved up and as the plane took off, and there was not one sign of the aircraft that was obviously soaked in a very dense, very heavy fog at the air, air base. Well, here's what we know. On board that plane, pilot John Shannon, his two daughters, his son-in-law, and a family friend were told they've been planning a day trip to Key West. The NTSB is investigating. Well, the president said there would be consequences, and now the Trump administration is delivering on those threats to the United Nations. Ambassador Nikki Haley announcing the U.S. has negotiated a historic reduction in the U.N.'s operating budget for the 2018 fiscal year. This comes just days after 128 countries denounced the president's decision to recognize Jerusalem as Israel's capital. David Lee Miller live in our New York City newsroom. Is There's a lot of news really out of uh, the U.N. now, David Lee. Indeed there is, uh, Leland. Let's start with this. Last year's U.N. budget was $5.4 billion, that's with a B, dollars. 
And according to U.S. U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley, the U.S. has now negotiated a $285 million budget reduction. That's about 5%. No specifics on how the money would be saved, but Haley said there have been reductions in what she called the U.N.'s bloated management while instilling more discipline and accountability. In a statement released by the uh, U.S. U.N. mission, Haley said, and I quote, the inefficiency and overspending of the United Nations are well known. We will no longer let the generosity of the American people be taken advantage of or remain unchecked. This historic reduction in spending, in addition to many other moves toward a more efficient and accountable UN, is a big step in the right direction. Haley's announcement follows a vote in the UN General Assembly rejecting President Trump's decision to recognize Jerusalem as Israel's capital. After the, that vote took place, the president threatened to cut funding to countries that voted against the United States. Ambassador Haley warned that the U.S. would be taking names. And true to her word, late last week, Haley announced that 64 countries that uh, did vote with the U.S. will be invited to a post or, 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 or did not vote against the U.S. will be invited to a post New Year's uh, party on the list of attendees, Togo, uh, Micronesia, as well as Guatemala. Guatemala, by the way, just announced that it is going to be moving its embassy to Jerusalem. Now, as for the U.N. budget, a recent study showed that U.N. employees generally earned higher salaries than their U.S. civil service counterparts. The United States is the single largest contributor to the United Nations, paying 22% of its basic budget. Japan is the second largest contributor at about 10%, which is less than half of what the U.S. pays in. And very, very quickly, Leland, on the complete other side of the spectrum here, 31 countries mm. contribute the, the bare minimum, which is 0.001%, or about $28,000 a year towards the UN budget. Yeah, and, and, and there's some diplomats who probably rack up close to that in parking tickets that are unpaid here in New York City. Uh, David Lee, appreciate you being with us. Waleed Ferris with a lot more on this coming up. Cheryl? Yeah, we've got a lot more on that story later on in the hour. And you know, as David Lee just reported, another nation is following America's example, planning to move its embassy in Israel from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Plus, the royal family celebrating Christmas with one addition to their group. There's Meghan Markle there on the left. We'll look at holiday ceremonies around the world coming up. So many people love her. And there's still some time to cut your taxes for 2017. What you can do now before the end of the year. You got a few days. $3.2 trillion in tax cuts for American families, including the doubling of the standard deduction and the doubling of the child tax credit. They're going to start to see that because we're signing today. They're going to start to see that in February. The numbers will speak. This is not the Christmas card you want. A Pennsylvania woman who got quite a shock from her electric bill on her statement, and there it is, a charge for $284 billion dollars. A lot of things would go through your mind right then, but then her son actually called the electric company and of course turns out the actual balance was $284.46. They say the decimal spot is in the wrong place. The woman says all she wants for Christmas now, and it actually says this, is a heart monitor. <laughs> uh, the other way to look at this, $284 billion of electricity, that is one heck of a Christmas light display. Yeah. And that, that is a really lit up house. I think 284 is still kind of a high electric bell. Yeah. So she yeah. has a lot of Christmas she lights does, yeah. anyway. Anyway, there you go. <laughs> now, this is the bill right here. And we're very proud of it. It's a, uh, it's gonna be a tremendous thing for the American people. It's gonna be fantastic for the economy. All of this, everything in here is really, uh, Tremendous things for businesses, for people, for the middle class, for workers. And I consider this very much a bill for the middle class and a bill for jobs. And jobs are produced through companies and corporations. And you see that happening. Corporations are literally going wild over this. President Trump keeping his campaign promise to cut taxes, signing the tax reform bill right before his Christmas deadline. Now, tax experts are offering advice on how to lower your taxes in the final days of 2017. Joining us now is Gene Marks, a CPA, small business advocate, business columnist for The Washington Post, and owner of The Marks Group. Gene, it's great to see you again. 
Thanks for having me on, Cheryl. Good last to see time, you. Last time we spoke, we were going through what we thought the tax bill was going to be. Now we've got it. And the biggest question is, I know many Americans are asking on the individual side, if there's some last-minute right. moves and deductions in particular they should be taking this year, this week, such as charitable deductions, to try and kind of take advantage of the last time they're going to be able to really use those deductions. Yeah, uh, 100%. First of all, let's remember, um, we, own, we still have six days left in the year, so.